10,000 Dreams Interpreted Book In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then Tenth Ten Thousand Dreams Interpreted Book In a dream in a vision of the night, when deep sleep. Ten thousand dreams interpreted. Ten thousand dreams interpreted. Book. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and selects bare instruction that he may withdraw a man from his purpose and hide pride from men. Dreams are rudiments of the great state to come. We dream what is about to happen. Bailey. The Bible, as well as other great books of historical and revealed religion, shows traces of a general and substantial belief in dreams. Plato, Gertie, Shakespeare and Napoleon assigned to certain dreams prophetic value. Joseph saw eleven stars of the zodiac bow to himself, the twelfth star. The famine of Egypt was revealed by a vision of fat and lean cattle. The parents of Christ were warned off the cruel edict of Herod, and fled with the divine child into an Egypt. Violet's wife, through the influence of a dream, advised her husband to have nothing to do with the conviction of Christ. But the gross materialism of the day laughed at dreams, as it echoed the voice and verdict of the multitude, crucify spirit, but let the flesh live. The rabbis, the robber, was said at liberty. The ultimatum of all human decrees and wisdom is to gratify the passions of the flesh at the expense of the spirit. The prophets and those who have stood near east. The fountain of universal knowledge used dreams with more frequency than any. Other the mode of divination. Profane, as well as sacred, history is threaded with incidents of dream prophecy. Ancient history relates that Genadius was convinced of the immortality of his soul by conversing with an apparition in his dream. Through the dream of Cecilia met Ella, the wife of a consul. The Roman Senate was induced to order the Temple of Juno Sospita rebuilt. The Emperor Martian dreamed he saw the bow of the Hunnish conqueror break in the same night that Adela died. Plutarch relates how Augustus, while ill, through the dream of a friend, was persuaded to leave his tent, which a few hours after was captured by the enemy, and the bed whereon he had lain was pierced with the enemy's swords. If Julius Caesar had been less incredulous about dreams, he would have listened to the warning which Calpurnia, his wife, received in a dream. Croesus saw his son killed in a dream. Petrarch saw his beloved lord. Laura, in a dream, on the day she died, after which he wrote his beautiful poem, The Triumph of Death. Cicero relates the story of two tra traveling Arcadians who went to different lodgings, one to an inn, and the other to a private house. During the night the latter dreamed that his friend was begging for help. The dreamer awoke, but thinking the matter unworthy of notice, went to sleep again. The second time he had dreamed his friend appeared saying it would be too late, for he had already been murdered and his body hid in a cart, under manure. The cart was afterwards sought for and the body found. Cicero also wrote, if the gods love men they will certainly disclose their purposes to them in sleep. Chrysippus wrote a volume on dreams as divine portent. He refers to the skilled interpretations of dreams as a true divination, but adds that, like all other arts in which men have to proceed on conjecture and on artificial rules, it is not infallible that Plato concurred in the general idea prevailing in his day, that there were divine manifestations to the soul in sleep. Condorcet thought and wrote with greater fluency in his dreams than in waking life. Tartini, a distinguished violinist, composed his devil sonata under the inspiration of a dream. Coleridge, through a dream influence, composed his Kubla Khan. The writers of Greek and Latin classics relate many instances of dream experiences. Homer recorded to some dreams divine origin. During the 3rd and 4th centuries, the supernatural origin of dreams was so generally accepted that the fathers, relying upon the classics and the Bible as authority, made this belief a doctrine of the Christian church. Synesius placed dreaming above all methods of dividing the future, he thought if surest, and open to the poor and rich alike. Aristotle wrote, there is a divination concerning some things in dreams not incredible. 
Camille Fly Marion, in his great book on premonitory dreams and divination of the future says, I do not hesitate to affirm at the outset that occurrence of dreams foretelling future events with accuracy must be accepted as certain. Joan of Arc predicted her death. Cazotte, the French philosopher and transcendentalist, warned Condorcet against. The manner of his death. People dream now, the same as they did in medieval and ancient times. The following excerpt from the unknown, a recent book by Flammarion, on the French astronomer, supplemented with a few of my own thoughts and collections, will answer the purposes intended for this book. From the Unknown. Published by Harper and Brothers, copyright, 1900, by Camille Flammarion. We may see with our eyes and hear without ears, not by unnatural excitement or for sense of vision or of hearing, for these accounts prove the contrary but by some interior sense, psychic and mental. The soul, by its interior vision, may see not only what is passing at a great distance, but it may also know in advance what is to happen in the future. The future exists potentially, determined by causes which bring to pass successive events. Positive observation proves the existence of a psychic world, as real as the world known to our physical senses. And now, because the soul acts at a distance by some power that belongs to it. We are authorized to conclude that it exists as something real, and that it is not the result of functions of the brain. Does light really exist? Does heat exist? Does sound exist? No. They are only manifestations produced by movement. What we call light is a sensation produced upon our optic nerve by the vibrations of ether comprising between 400 and 756 trillions per second undulations that are themselves very obscured. What we call heat is a sensation produced by vibrations between 350 and and 600 trillions. The sun lights up space, as much at midnight as at midday. Its temperature is nearly 270 degrees below zero. What we call sound is a sensation produced upon our auditory nerve by silent vibrations of the air themselves comprising between 32,000 and 36,000 a second. Very many scientific terms represent only results, not causes. The soul may be in the same case. The observations given in this work, the sensations, the impressions, the visions, things heard, etc., may indicate physical effects produced without the brain. Yes, no doubt, but it does not seem so. Let us examine one instance. A young woman, adored by her husband, dies at Moscow. Her father-in-law, at Polkovo, near St. Petersburg, saw her that same hour by his side. She walked with him along the street, then she disappeared. Surprised, startled, and terrified he telegraphed to his son, and learned both the sickness and the death of his daughter-in-law. We are absolutely obliged to admit that something emanated from the young woman and touched her father-in-law. This thing unknown may have been an ethereal movement, as in the case of light, and may have been only an effect a product, a result, but this effect must have had a cause, and this cause evidently proceeded from the woman who was dying. Can the constitution of the brain explain this projection? I do not think that any anatomist or physiologist will give this question an affirmative answer. One feels that there is a force unknown proceeding, not from our physical organization, but from that in us which can think. Take another example. A lady in her own house hears a voice singing. It is the voice of a friend now in a convent, and she faints, because she is sure it is the voice of the dead. At the same moment that friend has really died, 20 miles away from her. Does not this give us the impression that one soul holds communication with another? Here is another example of the wife of a captain who has gone out to the Indian mutiny sees one night her husband standing before her with his hands pressed to his breast, and a look of suffering on his face. The agitation that she feels convinces her that he is either killed or badly wounded. It was November 14th. The war office subsequently publishes his death as having taken place on November 15th. She endeavors to have the true date ascertained. The war office was wrong. He died on the 14th. A child six years old stops in the middle of his plate and cries out, Frightened Mama, I have seen Mama. At that moment his mother was dying far away from him a young girl at a ball stops short in the middle of a dance and cries, bursting into tears. My father is dead, I have just seen him. At that moment her father died. 
she did not even know he was ill. All these things present themselves to us as indicating not physiological operations of one brain acting on another, but psychic actions of spirit upon spirit. We feel that they indicate to us some power unknown. No doubt it is difficult to apportion what belongs to the spirit, the soul, and what belongs to the brain. We can only let ourselves be guided in our judgment and our appreciations by the same feeling that is created in us by the discussion of phenomena. This is how all science has been started. Well, and does not every one feel that we have here to do with manifestations from beings capable of thought, and not with material physiological facts only? This impression is superabundantly confirmed by investigation concerning the unknown faculties of the soul, when active in dreams and somnambulism. A brother learns the death of his young sister by a terrible nightmare. A young girl sees beforehand, in a dream, the man whom she will marry. A mother sees her child lying in a road, covered with blood. A lady goes, in a dream, to visit her husband on a distant steamer, and her husband really receives this visit, which is seen by a third person. A magnetized lady sees and describes the interior of the body of her dying mother, what she said is confirmed by the autopsy. A gentleman sees, in a dream, a lady whom he knows arriving at night in a railroad station her journey having been undertaken suddenly. A magistrate sees three years in advance the commission of a crime, down to its smallest details. Several persons report that they have seen towns and landscapes before they ever visited them, and have seen themselves in situations in which they found themselves long after. A mother hears her daughter announce her intended marriage six months before it has been thought of. Frequent cases of death are foretold with precision. A theft is seen by a somnambulist and the execution of the criminal is foretold. A young girl sees her fiancé, or an intimate friend dying, these are frequent cases, etc. All these show unknown faculties in the soul. Such at least is my own impression. It seems to me that we cannot reasonably attribute the provision of the future and mental sight to a nervous action of the brain. I think we must either deny these facts or admit that they must have had an intellectual and spiritual cause of the psychic order, and I recommend skeptics who do not desire to be convinced, to deny them outright, to treat them as illusions and cases of a fortuitous coincidence of circumstances. They'll find this easier. Uncompromising deniers of facts, rebels against evidence, may be all the more positive, and may declare that the writers of these extraordinary narratives are persons fond of a joke, who have written them to hoax me, and that there have been persons in all ages who have done the same thing to mystify thinkers who have taken up such questions. These phenomena prove, I think, that the soul exists, and that it is endowed with faculties at present unknown. That is the logical way of commencing our study, which in the end may lead us to the problem of the afterlife and immortality. A thought can be transmitted to the mind of another. There were mental transmissions, communications of thoughts, and psychic currents between human souls. Space appears to be no obstacle in these cases, and time sometimes seems to be annihilated. A few Years ago a person whom I will designate as a related a dream to me as follows, I take no interest in pugilism or pugilists, but I saw, in a dream, every detail of the Corvette and Fitz in its mill, four days before it took place out west. Two nights before the fight I had a second dream in which a favorite horse was running, but suddenly, just before the judge's stand was passed, a hitherto unobserved little black horse ran ahead and the crowd shouted in my ears. Fitz Simmons wins. Be relates the following as a dream, I saw the American soldiers, in clay-colored uniform, bearing the flag of victory two weeks before the Spanish-American War was declared, and of course before any living being could have known the uniform to be adopted. Later I saw, several days before the actual occurrence happened, the destruction of Chaveras fleet by the American Navy. Signed B. Just after the South African hostilities began, I saw in a dream a fierce struggle between the British and Boers, in which the former suffered severe losses. A few nights after I had a second dream in which I saw the contending forces in a long-drawn contest, very disastrous to both, and in which neither could claim a victory. They seemed to be fighting to a frazzle. Sign C. D related to me at the time of the occurrence of the dream the following, it had been suggested to me that the two cereals, corn and wheat, were too far apart, and that I ought to buy corn. At noon I lay down on a lounge to await. I had barely closed my eyes before a voice whispered, don't buy it, but sell that corn. What do you mean? I asked. Sell at the present price, and buy at 2378. The foregoing dream was related to me by a practical, 
successful businessman who never speculates. I watched the corn market and know it took the turns indicated in the dream. In this dream we find the dreamer conversing with some strange intelligence possessed of knowledge unknown to objective reason. It could not, therefore, have been the waking thoughts of the dreamer, for he possessed no such information. Was the message superinduced through the energies and activities of the waking mind on the subjective mind? This could not have been, because he had no such thoughts, besides, the intelligence given was free from the errors of the calculating and anxious waking mind. We must therefore look to other sources for an explanation. Was it the highest self that manifested to Abraham in the dim ages of the world? Was it the divine voice that gave solace to Krishna in his abstraction? Was it the unerring light that preceded Gautama into the strange solitudes of Asia? Was it the small voice that Elijah heard in the desert of Shuri? Was it the comforter of Jesus in the wilderness and the garden of distress? Or, was it Paul's indwelling spirit of this earthly tabernacle? One thing we may truthfully affirm, that it did not proceed from the rational, objective mind of the rank materialist, who would close all doors to that inner life and consciousness where all true religion finds its birthmark, its hope, its promises and its faith, which, rightly understood, will lead to the horrors of the Roman crucifixion the twin thieves, superstition and skepticism, while the angel of goodwill will go free to solace the world with the fruit and fragrance of enduring power. And promise. The steel chains that fasten these hydra-headed crocodiles of sensuous poison around love and destiny can only be severed by the diamond of wisdom and knowledge. A citizen worthy of confidence relates the following dream, in December, 1878. I saw in a dream my brother-in-law, Henry Yarnell, suffering from a bloody knife wound, after this I awoke, but soon fell asleep again. The second time I dreamed of a similar scene, except that the wound was the result of a shotgun. After this I did not go to sleep again. I was much troubled about my dream, and soon started in the direction of my brother-in-law's house. I had not gone far, when I met an acquaintance who promptly informed me that my brother-in-law had been shot. Sandy a well-known resident of Chattanooga, 10. Formerly of New York City, will vouch for the accuracy of the following incident in his life. On February 19, 1878, I was boarding with a family on Christopher Street, New York, while my wife and baby were visiting my parents in the country, a short distance from the city. Our baby was taken sick. The malady developed into brain fever, followed by water on the brain, causing the little one's death. At our boarding place there was at the time a quartet of us grass widowers, as we called ourselves, and in order to pass away the time pleasantly we had organized a Gra grass widow was Yucca Club. We used to meet almost every evening after dinner in the dining room, and play until about 11 o'clock when we would retire. On the above date I dreamed that after playing our usual evening games we took our departure five rooms, and on the way up the second flight of stairs I heard a slight movement behind me. On looking around I found I was being followed by a tall figure robed in a long, loose white gown which came down to the floor. The figure seemed to be that of a man, I would say, about seven feet tall, who followed me up the second flight and along the hallway, entering my room. After coming in the door he made a circle of the room and seemed to be looking for something, and when he approached the door to make his exit he stopped still, and with a gesture of his hand remarked. I have taken all you have. On the following morning, about 9.30 o'clock, I received a telegram from my wife announcing the death of our only baby. Signed F. A well-known citizen of Chattanooga, 10, relates and vouches for the truth of the following occurrence. Several years ago, when a boy, I had a schoolmate and friend, Willie T., between whom and myself there sprung up a mutual feeling of high regard. We were chums in the sense that we were almost constantly together, both at school and at home and among the partnerships we formed was one of having amateur shadowgraph and panoramic shows in the basement of Willie's home. This much to show the mental and social relationship that existed between us. Sometime during this association, I cannot recall the exact night now, I had a strange dream, in which my chum appeared to me with outstretched hand, asking me to shake, saying, I shall not see you anymore. With that, the dream lapsed and was over. I thought nothing of the occurrence, and had almost forgotten it, when one day, about a week later, during which time I had not had a glimpse of Macam, while he was out hunting with another friend, WMCC, in following him over a rail fence, the latter's gun was accidentally discharged in Willie's face and neck, resulting in instant death. With this shocking news the memory of the dream I had had came back to me vividly and puzzled me very greatly, and indeed has puzzled me to this day.
Signed you. The recipients of the above dreams are living today and their names and address may be obtained. None of them are credulous fanatics or predisposed to a belief in psychic or spirit phenomena. The above dreams, except two, cannot be explained by telepathy, because the mental picture cast and the dream mind had not in either instance taken place in waking life. This would account for the dream perception of Dean which did not, in all probability, take place until after the murder had been committed. The vision of F might be disposed of in the same way. In this instance F saw the white-robed specter open the door, walk around the room and finally, taking his position as if to depart, say, I have taken all you have. No doubt this vision took place at the exact moment of the child's death. There are thousands of similar experiences occurring daily in the lives of honest, healthy and sane human beings that rival the psychic manifestations of Indian yogism or Hebrew records. Still men go on doubting this true and loving subjective intelligence that is constantly wooing for entrance into the soul and is ever vigilant in warning their material life of approaching evils. They profess and saints of all ages, assuming appropriate symbols, as in the case of the vision of F where the angel of death was assumed. To Paul it appeared as a great personal truth whom he was relentlessly persecuting. To many a wayward son or daughter of the present time, it appears as a dead relative or friend, in order to approach the material mind and make its warning more effective to those who were interested in the teachings of Christ, but who after his death were inclined to doubt him. This high self materialized in the form of the great master in order to impress on their material minds the spiritual import of his teachings. So, to this day, when doubt and temptation by the moral instinct God, through the spiritual self, as Job says, approaches man while in deep sleep upon the bed to impress his instructions that he may change man from his purpose. God the spiritual world always fixes its orbit upon a straight line, while the material world is fonder of curves. We find man struggling through dreadful marshes and deserts of charlatanism in order to get a glimpse into his future, instead of solicitously following the straight line of inner consciousness that connects with the infinite mind, from which, aided by his church and the healthy action of his own judgment, he may receive those helpful spiritual impressions and messages necessary to solace the longings of the searching soul. The philosophy of the true master is the straight line. Pythagoras, Plato and Christ created angles by running vertical lines through the ecclesiastical and hypocritical conventionalities of their day. The new angles and curves thus produced by the bold philosophy of the humble Nazarene have confronted with impregnable firmness during the intervening ages the sophistry of the Pharisees. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from men. Job 33 and 15 Man cannot contradict the laws of nature, but are all the laws of nature yet understood? Real philosophy seeks rather to solve than to deny. Litten. Those who live active lives exclude spiritual thought and fill their minds with the fascinations of worldly affairs, pleasure and business, dream with less frequency than those who regard objective matters with lighter concern. The former depend alone upon the voluptuous warmth of the world for contentment, they look to money, the presence of someone, or to other external sources for happiness, and are often disappointed, while the latter, with a just appreciation of temporal wants, depend alone upon the inner consciousness for that peace which passeth all carnal understanding. They are strengthened, as will be that in Christ by suppressing the sensual fires for 40 days and nights in the wilderness of trial and temptation. Their number few, and are never disappointed, while the former number millions. Nature is threefold, so is man, male and female, son or soul. The union of one and two produced the triad or the trinity which underlies the philosophy of the ancients. Man has a physical or visible body, an atom of the physical or visible earth. He has a soul the exact counterpart of his body, but invisible and subjective. Incomplete and imperfect as the external man, or vice versa. The soul is not only the sun or creation of man, but it is the real man. It is the inner imperishable double or imprint of what has outwardly and inwardly transpired. All thoughts, desires and actions enter the soul through the objective mind. The automaton of the body responds as quickly to the bat of the eye as it does toth movement of the whole body. Find up the footsteps of man and the very hairs off his head are numbered thus it becomes his invisible counterpart. It is therefore the book of life or death, and by what he judges himself or is already judged. When it is complete nothing can be added or taken from its personnel. It is sometimes partly open to him in his dreams, 
but in death is clearly revealed that man has also a spiritual body, subjective to, and more ethereal than the soul. It is an infinitesimal atom, and is related in substance to the spiritual or infinite mind of the universe. Just as the great physical sun, the center of visible light, life and heat, is striving to purify the foul miasma of the marsh and send its luminous messages of love into the dark crevices of the earth, so the great spiritual sun of which the former is a visible prototype or reflection, is striving to illuminate with divine wisdom the personal soul and mind of men thus enabling him to become cognizant of the spiritual or Christ presence within the heresy and herd of wanton flesh, to generate victim of the sensuous felt hand fermentation of self-indulgence, is ever striving to exile and suppress, from the wilderness of sin, the warning cry of the Nazarite voice by intriguing with the cunning, incestuous daughters of unholy thoughts and desires. The objective mind is most active when the body is awake. The subjective influences are most active, and often fill the mind with impressions, while the physical body is asleep. The spiritual intelligence can only intrude itself when the human will is suspended, or passive to external states. A man who lives only in the sensual plane will receive his knowledge through the senses, and will not. While in that state, receive spiritual impressions or warning dreams. Men and women rarely ever degrade themselves so low that the small voice of the desert does not bring them a message. Sodom and Gomorrah, by with the adultery of a nameless crime were not deserted by the angel of love until the fire which they had lighted in their souls had consumed them. The walls of Jericho did not fall until the harlot had been saved and the inmate of her many times to repentance before it fell to David, while intoxicated with the wine of love, from languishing in the seductive embrace of the beautiful bathing nymph, Bathsheba, heard the voice of Nathan. Surely God is no respecter of persons, and will speak to all classes if the people will not stiffen their necks or harden their hearts. Women dream more often and more vividly than men because their dream composition is less influenced and allied to external environments. Old dreams possess an element of warning or prescience, some more than others. This is unknown to the many, but is known to the observing few. There were many people who have no natural taste for music, and who do not know one note from another. There are also those who cannot distinguish one color from another. So former there is no harmony of sound and to the latter there is no blending of colors dot they have heard and seen, but there is no artistic recognition of the same. Still it would be absurd to say to either the musician or the artist, your art is false and is only an illusion of the senses. One man apparently never dreams, another dreams occasionally, and still another more frequently, none attempt to interpret their dream, or to observe what follows. Therefore, the verdict is, there is nothing in dreams. Schopenhauer Atler says, no man can see over his own bite. Intellect is invisible to the man who has none. The first is like the blind man who denies the existence of light, because he does not perceive it. The second and third resemble the color blind man, who sees but who persists in calling green blue, and vice versa. A fourth man and sees in a dream a friend walking in his room. The vision is so vivid or instantly gets up and strikes the match that his friend died at the exact moment of the vision. At another time he hears in his dream a familiar voice cry out in agony. Soon he hears of the shocking accident or distressing illness befalling the one whose voice he recognized in the dream. For authentic records, see Flower Marion's Unknown. The third man, already referred to, has about the same dream experiences, but calls them strange coincidences or unconscious cerebration, etc. Again, the fourth man dreams of walking through green fields of corn, grass or heat. He notes after such dreams prosperous conditions follow for at least a few days. He also notes, if the area over which he passes is interspersed with rocks or other adverse signs, good and bad follow in the wake of the dream. If he succeeds in climbing a mountain and finds the top barren he will accomplish his object, but the deal will prove unprofitable. If it is green and spring-like in appearance, it will yield good results. If he sees muddy water, sickness, business depression or causes for jealousy may develop. A nightmare suggests to the dreamer to be careful of health and diet, to relax his whole body, to sleep with his arms down and keep plenty of fresh air in the room. He sums up the foregoing with a thousand similar dream incidents, and is led to believe certain dreams possess an element of warning. There are three pure types of dreams, namely, subjective, physical and spiritual. They relate to the past, present and future, and are influenced by past or subjective physical and spiritual causes. 
The latter is always deeply prophetic especially when it leaves a vivid impression on the conscious mind. The former too, possesses an element of warning and prophecy, though the trimmer. Thus he is back at the old home, and finds Mother Pell and aged, or ruddy and healthy, and the lawn withered or green. It all augurs, according to the aspect the picture assumes, Ella good fortune that physical dreams are more or less unimportant. They are usually superinduced by the anxious waking mind, and when this is so they possess no prophetic significance. Dreams induced by opiates, fevers, mesmerism and ill health come under this class. A man who gambles is liable to dream of cards, if he dreams of them in deep sleep the warning is to be heeded, but if it comes as a reverie while he sleeps lightly he should regard it as worthless. Such dreams reflect only the present condition of the body and mind of the dreamer, but as the past and present enter into shaping the future, the reflections thus left on the waking mind should not go by unheeded. We often observe matters of dress and exterior appearance through mirrors, and we soon make the necessary alterations to put our bodies in harmony with existing formalities. Then, why not study more seriously the mental images reflected from the mirror of the soul upon our minds through the occult processes within us? Thirdly, the spiritual dreams are brought about by the higher self penetrating the soul realm and reflecting upon the waking mind approaching events. When we put our animal mind and soul in harmony with our higher self we become one with it, and, therefore, one with the universal mind or will by becoming a part of it. It is through the higher self we reach the infinite. It is through the lower self we fall into the whirlpool of matter. These dreams are a part of the universal mind until they transpire in the life of men. After this they go to make a part of the personal soul. Whatever has not taken place in the mind, or life of man, belongs exclusively to the impersonal mind. But as soon as a man lives or sees a thing, that thing instantly becomes a part of his soul, hence, the clairvoyant, or mind reader, never perceives beyond. The personal ego, as the future belongs exclusively to God or the universal mind, and has no material, subjective existence, therefore, it cannot be known except through the channels of the higher self which is the truth or the word that is constantly striving to manifest itself through the flesh. Our psychical research people give us conclusive proof of mental telepathy or telegraphy between finite minds. Thus communications or impressions are conveyed many miles from one mind to another. This phenomenon is easier when one or both of the subjects are in a state of somnambulance or asleep. In thought transference or mind reading it is absolutely necessary to have a positive and a negative subject. Through the same law that mental impressions are telegraphed from one finite mind to another a man may place himself in harmony with the infinite mind and thus receive truth and healthful warnings of coming evil or good. Homer, Aristotle and other writers of the ancient classics thought this not improbable.